How's everyone doing today? Uh, glad to be here. Um, appreciate everyone uh, coming out today um, to uh, Chief Bryant, um, Chief Hap, uh, Director Clark, um, Ms. Director Carla as well, Ms. Stephanie, uh, Marion, uh, obviously uh, Mr. Mayor here, Mr. Uh, Ginther. Uh, just appreciate everyone for coming out here today. My name is Dominic Jones. I am the uh, Executive Director for Legacy Youth Academy. Um, over this past couple of years, I've had the pleasure and opportunity to work with a tremendous amount of youth in the city of Columbus. Uh, myself, I grew up right here down the street off St. Clair Avenue, uh, right here, so I feel definitely at home. And part of what we've been able to uh, still within our youth over these past couple of years, some of the same values and principles um, that we were raised on, that we were brought up on, our connectivity to our youth uh, over these last couple of years have been nothing short uh, of amazing. One of the things that we was able to, to do was uh, launch our LEC program. Uh, during a year where COVID had plagued our community and our kids, uh, we were able to get there together at LEC. We were able to serve uh, 83 students from September 14th through June 4th of 2021. Out of those 83 students, uh, we covered seven different school districts um, from those kids that reported every single day to us. So, yeah, they weren't going to school, but they were coming to us. Uh, we were able to not only uh, get them there. We offer transportation to those kids, pulled in kids from the north, south, and east side of Columbus. Um, but we also had zero reported COVID cases throughout that time. So I think that just speaks to a lot of the policies and procedures that we were able to have in place throughout that time. Um, our program, a cumulative GPA, uh, when we first started out that first semester was a 1.32 GPA. By the time that our program ended in June 4th, we had a cumulative GPA of 2.47 for our kids. So it just showed that the amount of support that we were able to give uh, over that course of that time, uh, it really paid dividends for our kids, having the tutors there on spot and still giving them that infrastructure that they needed to have throughout a time where kids couldn't actually be at school. Um, we also provided 4,440 lunches throughout that entire program in a time where uh, food and lunches, everything became to be a disparity. Um, you know, we were able to provide that uh, for children. So parents were able to send their kids to us knowing that they would be able to eat two meals a day normally like they would be at school. Um, you know, we had a 40, I mean, an 84% retention rate over the course of that, that school year. And I think that's important because, um, you know, it's hard to get uh, teenagers uh, and kids to show up at places. But during that time of COVID, um, we got kids again to show up at an 84% rate throughout the whole school year. And we're really pleased with that. We're really pleased with that. Um, not one incident was reported throughout that time. Uh, we didn't have not one fight amongst our kids. Not one police officer was called to our building for any other reasons. And I think, again, we, we, you know, we pride ourselves on building um, you know, something strong for our kids where they can feel safe. Right, and uh, I think that by us doing that, we also help take kids off the street where they ordinarily wouldn't be able to, you know, get in trouble and get into things that ultimately lead them into prison or anywhere else. Um, and then we had 100 percent great advancement. You know, every every kid that attended our program ultimately advanced. So that ultimately ended up catapulting us into the summertime. We were able to have our our lead and inspire summer program where we have 40 uh, young men, uh, pretty much between the ages of 11 to 16 years old. We were able to take those 40 young men. Uh, we took them on an HBCU tour. Um, out of those 40 students that went, 37 of those kids had never been out of the city of Columbus. And so if you think about that, and, and, and our children really have an opportunity to, to know what's out there outside of the circumstances that they live in, it was extremely important for us to get our kids out of here. We took them to Washington, D.C. Uh, we took them to Howard University. Um, they had a chance to visit uh, the Capitol building, also see the White House visit the african-american museum um it just was a phenomenal trip for our kids and so um that was one of the things that we was able to accomplish this summer um that we really thought was really cool on top of that we were able to launch our um our youth sports league uh, legacy youth academy um not only houses programs but we also um are able to service kids uh, from a youth standpoint, again, if you think about the pandemic and what it did to our community, specifically kids in our community, um, kids weren't able to participate in enrichment programs. Kids weren't able to participate in sports programs. Um, 
but that wasn't the same case for their counterparts in the suburban areas and suburban neighborhoods, but kids in the inner city were stripped of that. Well, we were able to get that back this year. Um, and not only were we able to come back uh, at, you know, at full strength, uh, we came back with 2,436 2, young men and young women who participated in youth sports this year, and that's grades K through eight. Um, we are the unofficially, you know, we unofficially serve as the middle school feeder system to the second largest school district in the Midwest, which is CCS. 93% um, of those kids uh, are CCS kids as well. So we know that we are touching our, a lot of the kids that are from the inner city right here um, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, you know, over the course of the year, from May 1st all the way uh, really through November 1st, we had roughly 25 to 30,000 people come through our gates. I think it's important to note that we didn't have not one police officer call to any of our events. And we have games every single Saturday at five different locations. I think that's really important to note um, because I think sometimes there's a negative perception, you know, built inside the city that, you know, it really can't come together without having issues. And I think we really just show that, you know, no matter what, you know, we were able to come together, show our kids a good product um, and also uh, lead them to other things outside of sports. We firmly believe that uncoachable kids become unemployable adults. So one thing that we wanted to make sure that we do was not only, again, build a league and the infrastructure uh, centered around wins and losses, but how do we build uh, a youth sports league, you know, that builds the next mayor, you know, that builds the next police chief, the next fire chief, because we all know that these kids, majority of these kids are going to go pro in something else, right? Um, so, you know, um, we have to uh, thank um, you know, Nationwide Children's Hospital, you know, we believe that we can't do this alone. Yeah, we get a lot of kids to show up. Um, you know, these kids show up Monday through Thursday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. for two hours a day for practice and all day, usually on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, but we couldn't have done that without the help of, of, of Children's Hospital as well. This year, <laughs> we reached out to Children's Hospital and we said, hey, you know, we have a bunch of kids. We need sports physicals. They said, well, we don't really do sports physicals. We do, we do wellness uh, visits. So what we'll do, DJ, hey, let's pull up, you know, to all your, uh, your practice sites and we're going to do, um, you know, these wellness visits. I said, well, there's a lot of kids. There's a lot of kids now. I just don't know how many. They said, no, nah, we'll be okay. Well, if you talk to Michelle from Children's, she'll tell you. She said, DJ, my nurses are overwhelmed. There's about 50 to 60 kids at every site, and it's hard for us to do what we need to do just in two to three hours. We can't see all the kids. But what we grew to see was that so many of our kids that was inside of our program were behind on immunization shots shots that they would ultimately need to go into, um, you know, to get into school when the school started back up. You know, and a lot of doctor's appointments were pushed back. A lot of parents couldn't get appointments into school, but we were able to kill that. Kids were able to get in, get updated shots. Some of the kids even um, got some medical issues uh, taken care of that they didn't know that they even had and that existed. So I believe that, you know, one thing that we've uh, been able to do is get our kids here and we've been able to reimagine safety through not only our youth sports programs but through other programs as well um, one of the big things i think we've done this year too we had a dream big weekend we bought in over 200 young ladies grade six seven eight years old bought them to a hotel for two days pretty much poured inside them it was a young women's empowerment event um, where we taught those young girls about hygiene we taught them dream blockers you know their self-value self-worth uh brought them and had a nice ballroom dinner they had TikTok dance contests etc um but for us you know it was events like this um that ultimately we feel like we had to start doing in order for our kids to have a, a wholesome experience now again not only just to use sports but experience that that they should have as adolescents um and so i'll finish up you know um, my hand by saying you know we got over 500 volunteers um you know just across um, our league front and I think the amazing work that we've been able to do um, we wouldn't been able to do without the Department of Neighborhoods we wouldn't have been able to do all right without our mayor all right we wouldn't have been able to do now you know we got our chief that and our assistant uh, our first assistant chief that's been able to come and support us at our events we wouldn't be able to do this if we didn't have the support of not only of our community all right but our city officials and so I just know that we thank them for believing in us and trusting in us uh, and making an investment to us to continue to do the work that we, you know, that we love to do and the work that really needs to be done in the city. So, again, I appreciate everyone for coming out here today. Thank you for, you know, listening to me talk about a little bit about we, uh, what we've done. I can go on and talk more about what we've done, but I don't have the time to do so. So um, I'll make sure I close up here. Again, I thank everybody for coming out. And I think uh, Mr. Mayor Ginther is coming up next.
Well, there's a reason that we had uh, Dominic, better known as DJ from Legacy U, kick us off at one of our most important neighborhood safety announcements uh, and an update to our comprehensive safety plan. We've said it many times before, uh, neighborhood safety is about so much more than just our first responders. Our police officers and firefighters, EMS, paramedics, all have an important role to play with neighborhood safety, but so does everybody else in our community. And so we're grateful for DJ and all of his great partners at Legacy U. I wanna thank Safety Director Clark, as well as Chiefs uh, Bryant and Hap for all their work uh, on what we're gonna to share today. Marion Stuckey, Dr. Roberts, and the team at Columbus Public Health, Carla William Scott in the Department of Neighborhoods, Stephanie Hightower for hosting us again in her parking lot for another major announcement here at the Urban League, uh, Director Joe Lombardi in the Department of Finance. Next week, I'll deliver my proposed 2022 operating budget to Columbus City Council. I'm grateful to Director Lombardi and all of the staff working so hard to develop this budget proposal. We know that in order for us to continue our work on neighborhood safety and in keeping up with previous operating budgets, public safety, neighborhood safety is a central focus for the coming year, totaling more than $660 million or 64% of the general fund budget. My thanks to Director Clark, Chief Bryan, Chief Happ, and all our residents, partners, and community leaders for their feedback, insight, and direction throughout this process. As I have said many times, and it bears repeating today, our city is at a crossroads. How we recover and rebuild from an unprecedented time in our history matters. We must make informed and forward-reaching decisions now. We are embracing collaboration and flexibility to generate the most effective and responsive solutions to the host of challenges confronting Columbus. We continue to incorporate and respond to new data, changing circumstances, and valued expertise at every step along the way. Because we cannot build the safest, most inclusive, and most resilient future for all of our neighbors and our neighborhoods, with also being nimble, innovative, and proactive. I'm proud of the speed at which we've implemented some of the most sweeping police reforms in our city's history. We've changed the city's use of force policy, implemented independent investigations into instances of deadly force, established the Civilian Police Review Board and Inspector General for the Division of Police, developed immersive community-based training for new recruits, enhanced the body-worn camera program, and successfully negotiated historic changes to the FOP contract that will benefit both our residents and our officers. We hired, for the first time in the division's history, a chief from outside the division of police, and for the first time in our city's history, we're working, we invited and we're working with the Department of Justice Cops Office to help us reform our division of police. The new FOP contract includes several significant reforms, including an officer retirement incentive program. This program provides a pathway for senior officers who no longer wish to serve to leave without financial hardship. It also opens up the door for younger, more diverse officers trained in community policing to ascend throughout the ranks, accelerating the pace at which we're more, we more fully embody a 21st century community policing model. Of course, we remain mindful of the increase in separations among our sworn safety forces, especially in the Division of Police. My proposed operating budget includes more than $9 million for three new recruit classes in both police and fire, which will add a total of 170 new police officers and 125 new firefighters to our safety forces in the coming year. Our newest police officers in particular will be trained extensively in community policing, which is crucial to bridging the divide 
between the community and law enforcement and alleviating the current spike in crime. At the same time, we're pursuing plans to expand police reserve units and support lateral moves from other agencies to further strengthen our public safety forces during a period of profound transition and demand. Although our work requires that we keep a watchful and discerning eye on the future, we also recognize that we have an urgent duty to care for the officers we already have. The 2022 operating budget will include new investments in wellness programs that connect first responders with clinicians who impart valuable skills, knowledge, and resources, empowering our officers to thrive both on and off duty. This, in addition to the planned Police and Fire Joint Wellness Center, funding for which was part of our capital improvements budget approved by City Council just last week. Our commitment to holistic health and well-being extends to the broader community as well. Earlier this year, we launched the Alternative Response Pilot Program, which embeds social workers and mental health specialists within 911 dispatch to ensure the right response for residents facing emergencies while freeing up our police officers to fight violent crime. The pilot was a success, reducing the number of immediate police and fire dispatches by 62% and fully resolving or redirecting 48% of incoming calls to other supportive agencies or services. In 2022 operating budget, we'll be devoting more than $5 million to expand this important and proven new program. The philosophy underpinning alternative response underscores a meaningful and pertinent truth. We cannot solely police our way beyond the status quo. We must bring to bear the full weight and power of our collective resources and expertise to reduce violent crime and improve quality of life across our city. Our strategies, however, will not succeed unless they address the root causes of crime. Since joining the city only a few weeks ago, our Public Safety Director Robert Clark has been working in partnership with Chief Happ and Chief Bryant to revise and update our comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy. As you will learn from him in a few moments, this new plan works on numerous fronts and on numerous levels, from prevention, intervention, and diversion, to treatment, rehabilitation, and more, to reduce crime by deploying a range of innovative and evidence-based strategies that promote safety and protect neighborhoods. Everyone has a role to play in a safer, more resilient Columbus. But we cannot restore our city to its best and full potential without first recruiting and rewarding exceptional talent and equipping our safety forces with the capacity to respond quickly, effectively, and proactively across the entire community. To tell you more about these plans that are being implemented at the Division of Police, I'm pleased to turn it over to our Chief, Chief Elaine Bryant. Good afternoon. First, I want to say to um, Mr. Jones, DJ, we had an opportunity, Assistant Chief Potts and I, to attend the uh, championship cheer and dance competition. And it was phenomenal to watch not only those young ladies uh, perform, but to watch the families and the community come together. It was a really phenomenal event, and I look forward to supporting your endeavors in the future. It's no secret that we are down officers in this division. This has been a challenge to navigate while also making sure the needs of the community remain our priority. I've asked for additional resources and the mayor and the, and the director have responded in a very positive way to that request. While we look to add additional officers, we have to be more efficient with the personnel that we have. That's why my team and I are in the process of reorganizing our department we did an audit and we're looking at personnel across the board because we want to make sure that the personnel that we put in place are doing the best that they can to respond to the community needs and to make sure that the division is using the resources to the best of their ability. In that effort, 
the community liaison program is of utmost importance to us because we understand that that, that, that that program is very efficient in responding to the quality of life issues in the community. We're down two spots in the community liaison officer program and we plan to fill those by the end of the year. But in addition to that, we're looking to grow that program down the road. We understand that one community liaison officer is not enough for a precinct. We wanna make sure that we put more officers in that role so that they can get more acclimated to their residents, to the business, in their footprint, and be able to serve that community in a much better space. You heard the mayor state, while we need more police, we also need to be open to policing differently. I am committed to that. My team is committed to that. That includes ensuring that officers are following best practices of 21st century community policing and ensuring that training our officers to serve then protect is a priority. Our department teamed up with Franklin University to provide community immersion training for our officers. This focuses on understanding cultural differences and how different communities perceive police. We are also committed to aggressively recruiting new officers that reflect this community. Officers that are purposefully, tra purposefully trained in community policing. We are committed to creating a more diverse police department. Just this weekend, we're gonna be hosting a women's recruiting fair at the training academy. And when we get these new officers, they will join a force with a sharper fo focus on officer wellness. The mayor is not just investing in new officers. He is investing in the care of our officers. This is reflected and the creation of a brand new first responding wellness center and early intervention programs to help identify officers who may be suffering professionally and personally. In order to police differently, we have to engage our community and city partners in this effort. Partners such as our public health department and Columbus Fire Department to deliver specific and more effective responses that better meets the needs of our residents. To share more about some of the initiatives, please welcome Fire Chief Hatton. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Bryant. <clears throat> a, community, a community problem requires a community response. As your Fire Chief, I'm excited to work alongside these great leaders with, within our community and the partners to share the innovative, forward-thinking ways we can work together building a safer, healthier, and stronger Columbus. For public safety to be effective, we must work together as a team and not in silos, requiring collaboration, communication, and coordination, working across traditional agency lines. The Columbus Division of Fire is proud to be part of several multi-agency programs that have shown very promising results and appreciate the mayor's support and continued and expand these programs. The lessons learned and success of the Responder React and Spark programs provide a solid foundation for the new Alternative Response Program. This innovation resulted in creating a unit which embeds a social worker from Columbus Public Health into the Emergency 911 Call Center to assist with triaging calls and determining the best response. As you heard from Mayor Ginther, combining the skills of mental health professionals with the expertise of our 911 dispatchers and fire personnel have resulted in providing the right response in the right amount of time for individuals in their time of crisis. Instead of traditional police or fire response to every call, this program identifies the specific needs of the caller, whether it's mental health support, addiction services, or other social needs, providing the caller the most appropriate and available resource. For calls that still require a traditional police or fire response, the ARU professionals have been able to de-escalate volatile situations and provide pre-arrival instructions before officers or paramedics arrive at the scene. With the mayor's proposed funding and support, the alternate response project will continue to grow and expand as we redefine public safety response to 911 calls for service. We must always keep an eye on the traditional work of the Division of Fire, which entails responding to emergency medical calls and fire responses, 
across the country and here locally. The fire service has been impacted by an increased number of retirements and separations as well. I would like to thank Mayor Ginther for the proposed hiring of an additional class of recruit firefighters in the 2022 budget. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Along with our successful cadet program, this funding for additional recruits will allow us to continue to improve the, improve the quality and scope of training we did deliver to increase the diversity of the ranks of our future firefighters, paramedics, and promoted officers. CFD strives to be a division undivided, united through diversity as we lean forward preparing for the future of public safety. Your Columbus firefighters have a long-standing history of trusted engagement within the community, providing a safe haven in your neighborhoods and connecting with our youth on a daily basis. As firefighters, we realize the best approach to addressing emergency situations is through prevention and education before the response ever occurs. Your Columbus firefighters have been and will continue to play a proactive role with our public safety and community partners, providing community safety day resources, citizen responder training, and through our React Buddies mentorship program. These and the other innovative programs you will hear about not only prevent and reduce 911 calls, they will improve the quality of life of our most vulnerable residents in our community. We are grateful for our leadership, recognizing the values in these programs, and continuing the growth through continued investment and support. Thank you. Now please welcome our dynamic new director, Public Safety, Robert Clark. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. You know, it is said that if you pay attention every day, there will be inspirational moments. Well, for me today, that inspirational moment was when DJ shared that every uncoached kid is an unemployable employee. And that resonated with me because I used to be one of those kids. So thank you for the work that you do, DJ. You know, I want to share with you that I'm in my seventh week where I've had the honor to work with some amazing professionals in the Department of Public Safety. And I'm so thankful to the mayor and his team for entrusting me with the director of public safety in the city of Columbus. It's a coming home for me as I grew up in Youngstown, just north of here. So mayor, thank you for this opportunity. But he also shared with me that he wanted a new neighborhood safety strategy. And that was my day one priority beyond diversifying public safety. So I recognized in working with the chief, working with the assistant chief, working with the fire chief, that we would have to engage our community. We would have to engage our neighborhood for safety strategy. It was not just our strategy, but it was the neighborhood strategy. We recognize that a lot has changed since the last one of 2018. The pandemic has changed us and a wide variety of other social uh, and political and economical crises have impacted that strategy. So it was necessary for us to take the time to conduct roundtables and workshops and meet with partners both in city government and outside of city government to determine just what that strategy would look like for 2021 and beyond. I've actually stretched it to 2023 just so that we have some room to grow and it forces us to grow into the year beyond this next coming year. Some of the things that I am proud to announce to you today will be our group violence intervention program, which is a holistic way to engage our community using a wide variety of resources, coupled with the fact that we will continue to enforce gun laws. We will continue to arrest those individuals who are caught with weapons, and we will partner with a variety of partners at a variety of levels to include the federal level, such as our partners with the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, where we are running a gun violence task force right now. As you've already heard from Chief Happ, we're expanding what you've already heard to be alternative response and react. This is a holistic way for us to engage those individuals who are either suffering from mental health issues, addiction issues, and follow up with them to see what services and resources we can get for them that exist here in the city or beyond. Having worked in the addiction space, I recognize how important this work is. And just in the time that REACT and SPARK has been in existence, they have reduced the workload for not just our police officers, but for our fire personnel as well. Our Safe Streets program, 
We've recognized recently the talent and the experience and the engagement that we have in our bike patrols and our officers are engaging the community in a powerful way, not just to enforce the law, but to serve the communities, but doing those two things together. We are currently investing $2.5 million in a body-worn camera system, an upgrade to the system we currently have, which will include a variety of software applications so that we can demonstrate to the public as we engage in a process of building back better and building back trust and building back accountability that the camera system we have will meet those demands. As I had the opportunity to have a, a briefing with our TAPS program, our teens and police services, who are engaging our youth where they are in our schools, that we are engaging them with mentorship and modeling what we want to see from our children. The officers who work in the TAPS program are phenomenal, and this will be something that we're going to be enhancing and going to more schools so that we can impact more children because myself, the chief of police, the assistant chief of police, the fire chief, we recognize we have to meet our children much earlier than when they get into high school. So we're going to be in the process of doing that as well. As a man of faith, this is what's really critical for me, is our chaplain corps. We are expanding our chaplain corps that will be in the community, engaging our victims and our families who suffer from trauma, engaging our police officers to make sure that they have that faith-based support in concert with our faith-based partners. We've had the opportunity to hear a little bit about today about officer safety. Even when we recognize all that our community has been through, we recognize that our police officers have been through a lot of things too. One of the things that we forget is that our police officers are human beings too. They have problems and issues and things that break down, kids that don't listen, all the things that the rest of us suffer, including myself. So we recognize that officer wellness is absolutely critical. Officer mental health is absolutely critical. So our neighborhood safety strategy is going to involve partnerships to make sure our officers are not only taking care of our residents, but also taking care of each other. As you've heard today, we've made large investments across a full spectrum here in the city of Columbus in the Division of Public Safety, as well as a variety of other resources. But here's what we have not mentioned today, and I share this with the public that will view this and hear this. We need your partnership. We need your engagement. And we're looking forward to being able to partner with you in a proactive way, not just reactive, to bring the health, healing, and restoration that all of us want to see in the city of Columbus. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, it's now my honor to introduce to you Director uh, Carla Williams Scott from Neighborhood Services. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Again, I'm Carla Williams Scott, Director of the City of Columbus Department of Neighborhoods. Thank you, Mayor Ginther, and my colleagues from the city for your commitment to keeping our residents and our neighborhood safe. Also, thank you to our amazing community partners, two of whom are here with us today. Dominic DJ Jones for working together with us in our effort to keep Columbus communities thriving and safe. Partnering with the Columbus Urban League and Legacy U allow us to provide important programming, training and outlets, safe outlets for our young people. Our comprehensive neighborhood strategy is again holistic in nature. We recognize the importance of investing in our young people. This year, the My Brother's Keeper initiative included summer youth employment programs involving 14 of our community partners that engaged over 2,700 young people. These programs focused on career exploration, violence reduction, and summer enrichment. All of our participants were engaged in conflict resolution training, financial literacy awareness, and classes to build self-awareness and their understanding of trauma and its impact. Participants also took the I Matter Anti-Violence Pledge, developed by the African American Male Wellness Agency, which was, again, one of our summer partners. We are grateful to all of our partners 
For example, I think DJ shared with you that they serve over 2,500 students during the summer through academic enrichment program and legacy youth sports. They have demonstrated a commitment to our young people on and off the field, and for that we are grateful for their partnership. The Columbus Urban League continues to be a pillar in our community through the Neighborhood Violence and Intervention Program and I Am My Brother's Keeper. They support youth and families and build resilient and stable lives. All of our programming, again, includes sessions on trauma-informed care, resiliency, and social-emotional care. We have found these sessions to be paramount for our youth as they navigate through today's environment. The MBK programming is working. The data collected from our programming in 2020 provides an ex excellent example. Of the 645 young people we engaged in our BOOST program during the pandemic when school was out, only three were involved in acts of violence. Again, this comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy is how we focus on people and place. Through our nuisance abatement program, we address issues in our community, such as lighting, sidewalks, and trash. Most recently, we have invested in new LED lighting on six residential streets in Linden. We have another 16 to 20 streets planned for next year's investment. Our alley cleanups have removed over 100 tons of trash from, and debris from our target neighborhoods. This is critical to neighborhood safety. We know there is a correlation between locations of illegal dumping and violent crime. We have invested approximately $300,000 in additional sidewalk investments. These are helping our young people get to school safely. As we turn our attention to 2022, we look forward to continuing key investments in people and places across Columbus that will enhance community safety. And now it is my pleasure to bring up President Stephanie Hightower. Sorry about that. <laughs> Marion Stuckey from the Columbus Care Coalition. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you. For the past five years, the Columbus Care Coalition has utilized community oriented and focused approaches to address the emotional and social impact after violence. This has included providing programming and direct outreach to support healing and creating spaces for those most impacted to be heard and seen. This year, our team and community partners have offered over 75 healing-based activities, including neighborhood outreach averaging 40 to 50 homes per month, and that's direct door-to-door -door canvassing post-homicide, and unique events that have catered to addressing the wide variety of difficult and challenging situations that are faced within the community each and every day. Our work is focused on addressing the aftermath of the constant and repeated exposure to violence, grief, and loss. Through many activities, including, as I mentioned, door-to-door -door canvases, youth and adult support groups, and post-homicide family outreach, we strive to be there for those in need, ensuring that the skill set needed to address the crisis is always present. Further, we've worked diligently to uplift community voice and create authentic avenues for hope and change, which is of course a huge part of resiliency. So much of our work has been done to create ongoing space for those with lived experience to be a part of our work. Within the coalition, we've approached the work with the saying that when trauma happens to one, it happens to all of us. And what that means is there is much work to be done in mitigating the impact of, tra of trauma and reducing um, the, psychological, the psychological impact as well. And that no matter where we live, we can all play a part. While we also continue to make the important steps of acknowledging and giving voice to pain and loss in neighborhoods, at the same time, we are working diligently with partners to intervene and prevent violence that causes so much of the harm that we see each day from the lens of compassion and the possibility of change. While change is not easy, it is possible. Our work has often uplifted the unique challenges of affected populations, especially boys and men of color, to overcome systemic challenges and provide spaces to be understood and welcomed. 
through city leadership and the leadership of CPH, we've been able to make strides using the public health approach to addressing violence and racism. This means working to understand the causes, creating awareness and prevention, and treatment of violence by working with those most at risk. The old saying of violence begets violence is very true, and it can create predictable patterns for opportunity for in intervention. It also allows us to look back over the life course of someone's life to better understand what they've been through and utilize relationships to help them make changes. A public health approach leans into many systems for collaboration, acknowledging that the work of violence reduction does truly take a community and our responses must be fair and balanced. Finally, through this lens, we can utilize proactive upstream approaches to work with those most at risk when the first signs of violence are present and expand that work to addressing community and social norms, fully acknowledging the impact of both historical and current factors that contribute to the impact of uh, violence on communities, including racism and inequality. Our work with the VOICE program, a hospital-based violence intervention program, reroute for youth and families, the right response, and our upcoming work with community members through a trauma-informed community advocacy lens are all important parts of this evolving work. Thank you so much. Next, we'll have uh, President Stephanie Hightower from the Columbus Urban League share a few comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm usually, um, when I run a relay, I'm usually the first leg, because that's the fastest leg. So I don't get to be anchored too often, so I appreciate this opportunity to be, uh, to close this out and wrap it up. Uh, I've been taking a lot of copious notes over there. Let me say thank you to the mayor uh, for recognizing the Columbus Urban League um, as an anchor institution. For too long in this community and across the country, the racial equity and cultural competency lens has been ignored. That's what this organization represents. And we appreciate that you recognize that and continue to be supportive of the efforts and the work that we do here at the Columbus Urban League. To our chiefs, um, to hear the continuous community policing um, as a part of the vocabulary is encouraging. Reimagining neighborhood safety is so important. And so uh, we just appreciate the opportunity, uh, Director Scott, to be involved in what we hope is going to be a new exciting program, the Parent Enrichment Program for our justice involved young people and their families so that we can begin to keep them on the right track. We also, again, uh, Director Scott, appreciate you recognizing um, the uh, intervention program. Uh, my lead intervention specialist, Adrian, is here, um, who is out there putting his life on the line, making sure that our gang prevention efforts are well intact. And I know that the chief, we've talked about how we can do more with working together as opposed to working apart on uh, these efforts. Uh, Dominique, you and I, I was loving you until you basically said that the chief got invited to the cheerleading competition. So now we got issues. I've been here for how many years? I have been invited to come judge, you know, the cheerleading competition. Hopefully we can rectify that in the near future. In all seriousness, no, Chief, one of the things that you and uh, Director Clark talked about um, was really important, serving first and protecting second. Um, and I heard um, building back trust. I heard connecting with youth and engaging our youth. And Dominique talked about that. Uh, there's an article in today's dispatch on the front page, and it talks about police hurt thousands of teens each year. An alarming number are black girls. And so I hope that as we are looking at engaging our youth, um, that there is that training that goes along with our police so that they don't adulterize our black youth in a way so that they cannot have a successful outcome. And with, with programs like Dominique's, these are not new programs. Sports have been a part of our community for years. We shouldn't have to have someone who is scraping by, who is committed to our youth, putting programs together like this because there isn't enough money. And so I just commend you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Carla, for thinking outside the box, for reimagining our sports programs for our kids, for understanding 
that this is about health and safety. And so I hope that our other private funders in this community will see programs and individuals like Dominique and what he's doing and that they will join with the mayor, with the chiefs, with the safety director, with neighborhoods, with the CARES folks to be able to reimagine what programming and public safety really needs to look like. And it's not the same old, same old. It's the things that he's talking about and what he's doing that really makes a difference for our young people in this community. So thank you again for being here at the Columbus Urban League. I need to move out the way because I know you have a million questions for the real people up here. But thank you for being here and thank you for helping us reimagine public safety and public health in this community. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, uh, Stephanie, and thank you for all, all of our uh, speakers who are working to make a lasting difference in our community. We will not achieve our goals overnight. It will require time, patience, perseverance, collaboration to see these plans through. The challenges we face are complex and they're varied, and so too are the solutions. But we are steadfast in our resolve to always do more do better and achieve the greatest possible impact. We will continue to study and evaluate our efforts, identify promising new methods and strategies, but also make changes where change is needed while never being daunted or deterred by the scale or difficulty of the task at hand. Columbus bands together time and time again to meet the needs of the moment and to exemplify the exceptional standard to which other communities aspire. We have done it before, and we will do it again. This is the largest investment in neighborhood safety in our city's history. But as you've heard today, it isn't just into the Department of Public Safety and into police and fire. A comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy we look forward to releasing the full operating budget next week and outlining additional priorities and areas of focus for the administration. And with that, we'll be happy to take your questions. Lacey? Mayor, uh, two years ago, the Matrix report said that CPB needed an additional 200 officers. Currently, the department is down about 150 officers through attrition, retirements, etc. Even with additional 170 officers, it's barely keeping up with attrition. So how does the city plan on keeping up with the number of officers, especially as the population of the city continues to grow? It's, a, it's an important point and one we're committed to. I, I believe if we continue to grow our local economy, and work to make other reforms as we've talked about here today we can get uh, more officers uh, serving the public and in neighborhoods by doing some of the things we've talked about today in addition to having this significant investment in new classes my hope is that by continuing to grow our economy and protecting our revenues in the future we'll be able to make investments in police classes similar to this in the years ahead I think this is also a perfect example. There are folks that have said you have to choose safety or reform. We reject false choices. And I think what we're proposing here with this new safety plan and the budget proposal is that we can do both. Other questions? You guys gonna let Lacey ask all the questions, Andrew? <laughs> You're on the alternative response unit. Is that five million you mentioned? Is, is the five million you mentioned on the alternative response program, is that an annual budget figure? And do you have any other numbers you can put to that, like the number of personnel, et cetera? I may let uh, the, the chief, the director, or Chief Hap, uh, Chief Bryan or Chief Hap speak to some of the specifics. We believe that that helps us grow what was a six week pilot. Uh, this year into uh, a program that will run for the entire uh, 2022 calendar. Any other specifics, either Chief or Director, you want to offer? Uh, Mr. Mayor, what was the question again? I could. About, it, it was specific resources for the alternative press. Source. Um, I guess the question is, in your budget, is does that now have an annual annual budget line? How much is that? And then how many? How much personnel are we talking? We can get you that information unless Chief Hap, do you want to? No, I don't have it. 
Okay, we'll, we'll get you the specifics on the amount of officers, uh, 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 nurses, mental health professionals, uh, as well as firefighters, paramedics. But I can tell you this, this is one of the most promising pilots we've done in recent years. And the reason we've gone from uh, you know, this six week pilot to funding it for an entire year is leading up to the opening of the crisis center that Adam H will open in 2024. Our hope is to build, you know, uh, the muscle memory and capacity as a city so that we can really capitalize and taking advantage of that. So we're working closely with Adam H and other partners as well to improve the system uh, and make sure that we really get a return on investment because the folks that we're getting the right response to and ultimately getting to a crisis center in 2024 means more of our officers are out in our neighborhoods helping to reduce violent crime and make our neighborhoods safer. Lacey. Um, you've invested, the city's invested money in groups like the CARE Coalition, My Brother's Keeper, etc. in the past. A lot of CARES Act dollars went to groups like that. Um, how can you point to proven success given the fact that we tied the homicide record yesterday in the city of Columbus? Well, I think you could hear a little bit of the results uh, from some of the other speakers, but particularly DJ, uh, and the impact that he and Legacy U is having on young people. Um, I believe this, that there are cities across this country that are suffering with a staggering rate of violence. Columbus is no exception to that. Uh, we believe that the, the, the way forward, and we've done this before, after record level of homicides in 2017, the comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy led to reductions in homicides and violence in 2018, 2019, only to have a record level of 20 uh, in 2020 and now in 2021. We think this comprehensive approach is the best way forward. But what we said before is, we're going to look at the results and the data, the impact we're having, uh, and we're going to invest in things that are working, but we're going to stop doing things that aren't working. And I think we've also showed a, a willingness to do that. I also believe we're not going to see the results overnight of some of these approaches. We didn't before. Uh, and we're not going to this year, uh, but you do have our commitment uh, to do everything in our power. And we're not going to stop. We're not going to yield until we have the safest big city in America. Tom, did you have a question? Give me a second for a one-on-one -on -one effort. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you've been mayor for the top three years for homicides in the city's history. What do you plan on doing to continue to make sure that another record is not set? I think we've just spent about an hour talking about that, but uh, we'll be happy to share the full list of everything that uh, we're proposing. We believe that it's a comprehensive approach. It's supporting our officers, our firefighters, uh, making sure that they're bringing their best selves to work. It's also about recruiting folks that are committed to uh, community policing uh, and encouraging other partners in the community to step up. The faith community, our nonprofits, we all have a role to play in community and neighborhood safety. Uh, and this is, will remain our top priority uh, moving forward. Any other questions? Thanks, everybody.